seem to be working, so um, I'll hold on to it on the chance that it does. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, um, I think I know most of the people in here, but there's a few new faces. So for those of you that have not been to SEI before, welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Fall. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and your, your general host, but I'm going to get off the stage very quickly because um, I want to introduce uh, Nancy Mead, who is one of our fellows here at, uh, at SEI, who will provide the, the larger bit of background. Um, this is, uh, I've been here just about <coughs> three years now, and this is the first time that we've jointly hosted with the School of Computer Science uh, a talk here. We're very pleased to do that and hope it's the beginning of many. This was facilitated by these folks and Mary Shaw, who's sitting in the front, and also Palma, who's here and is actually joining my office. We'll be working in the CTO's office uh, as of this week. So um, uh, again, once again, uh, thank you for coming. We hope that there'll be more of these kinds of things in the future, and I will hand it over to Dr. Mead, who will tell us and introduce Grady Bush here. Thank, thank you. you. I don't have a good voice like Kevin does. I, <laughs> I don't think that's nice question. No, I really have to. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, it's um, my pleasure to be here this morning. I first met Grady when I was at IBM, and he was the chief scientist at, at Rational. I was the software architect on a large ADA project. And the rational systems had their own custom hardware. So it was very interesting and quite a challenge at IBM to get them to actually purchase it because obviously it wasn't an IBM hardware. Uh, but we prevailed, and Grady came down from his uh, hideaway. We were told that he was writing a book, and he only came to visit very important customers. So I guess we more or less qualified. Um, that was the first time that we met, and more recently uh, at the ICSI conference, um, Grady gave a wonderful talk to a room full of people with his vision for software engineering, and I thought, this is great. People at the SEI need to know about this. So I passed around his slides to the uh, technical council that Kevin shares, and uh, Mark Sherman, who's right over here, looked at the slides and said, these are nice slides, but it would be nice to have the words that go along with them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, why, why are we thinking about this? Maybe we should just invite Grady to come here. Uh, and so uh, with Mary Shaw helping me, we um, started a discussion. And um, <coughs> as Kevin said, we had uh, great support from Palmer and on the computer science side from uh, Catherine Capetis. So I think you're going to find this talk inspirational, and for all of us in software engineering, it'll um, give us food for thought and help us to keep going and try to meet the challenge. So, Grady? Thank you. Pleasure. It's really amazing to be back here. Wow, there's a lot of people. Because <laughs> <laughs> I see some old friends and hopefully make some new ones. I can't believe I'm still doing this stuff, but I'm having way too much fun in what I do. And I'll first is an established large customer who says we've got all this billions and billions of lines of code and we're having difficulty transforming it, help us out. Or the other is, frankly, I go into startups who recognize that they're trying to build more than just disposable software, trying to build things a little bit that will, will be enduring. And so I'll, I'll give them a little bit of architectural and software engineering juju to keep them going. I had the opportunity to go into Facebook in its earliest days and it was fascinating because I could tell them that they had some interesting challenges. I'll tell you a quick story here. Uh, this was the time when all the Facebook engineers physically fit in the same room. It's actually a room smaller than this. And um, I could tell that they had a very curious software development process. It was pretty much non existent. Uh, these literally were pretty much kids, mostly in their 20s, would never go home. They'd hack away. And I saw the writing on the wall that at the point in time that they grew beyond that room, it was going to stress them out to no end. It was not too long after that Zuck bought the company on the East Coast, and you could see the tension happening there. 
I have a mole inside Facebook now. It's a gentleman by the name of Kent Beck. You may know Kent from the extreme programming days, and you may think he's the oddest person in the world on Facebook. But uh, Kent started out on a contract with him for a year. Kent is a rogue like I am. He didn't want to live in the Bay Area, so let's move this up so you can hear me. Hello, this is the Lord Noah. <laughs> This one's working too. It's a hardware problem. Can you all hear me reasonably well enough? Okay. At any rate, Kent worked there for about a year as a contract programmer, and they liked this stuff, and so he's there full time. But like me, he tends to work remotely. He try to like to do life work balance kinds of things. And Kent will occasionally chat, chat with me and cry on my shoulder about just the challenges working in that organization. It's, it's an interesting group. Uh, my personal opinion, not that of IBM, is they still have an incredibly immature development process, and you can kind of see it from the outside with the, the artifacts they produce. That's a story unto itself. Anyway, one of the things that I do is I continue to work in the architecture space. I'm still trying to write this handbook of software architecture, but the reason it's been delayed is because of the second thing I work on. I've been drawn into the IBM Watson stuff. A few years ago, when Ferrucci and crew had won the Jeopardy challenge, they parachuted me in and said, we've got all this code. Can you help us please explain what we did? So, <laughs> so I did the classical stuff I did do and just I basically helped them document their architecture. Philippe Crucian's 4 plus 1 model view, UML. Remind me and I could send a copy of this to you. It's, it's quite fascinating work. To understand IBM's architecture, you need to understand basically three things. First, you need to understand Mary Shaw's ideas of pipe and filter architectures. Watson is a pipe and filter based upon a thing called UEMA. Then you need to understand about 20 classes, mostly written in Java. And then you need to understand about a dozen patterns. You've done that, then you understand the essence of, I, of the Watson architecture. Now, the rest is certainly lots of implementation details, but, but that's the essence of it. So I was drawn into that effort, and as we then began to figure out how should we make money off of this, I was asked to lead uh, an effort to say, what should we do after Watson? And that was about two, three years ago. The net result of that is we formed the Watson Group, put a billion into it, got a couple of thousand people, and those were fun results. And so then after that, I said, well, what shall I do next? And this last year, I was tapped into saying, well, this has been great, Grady. What do we do after the after Watson? And that's been my task for the last nine months. Uh, the short answer is, I think the right thing to do is to put Watson inside a body. So let's embody Watson. Let's put it inside a humanoid robot. Let's put it inside an avatar. Let's put it inside an iPad that has a personality. So I think here's the question that's on my mind. What would it take to build a HAL? Seriously, that's, that's kind of where my head is. Uh, I've always tried to think boldly, and so this is kind of a reach. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> but that's what's on my head right now. The third thing that keeps me busy is my wife and I, for the last five, almost six years, have been on a journey to develop a documentary. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, the world exquisitely depends upon computing, he would say, say science, but much of the world does not understand computing as life science. So we've been on a mission to try to open the curtain to the beauty, the awe, the mystery of computing to the general public. Uh, a few years ago, I latched up with John Holler at the Computer History Museum. He has been our executive producer, our sponsor behind all this, and I've given a series of lectures at the museum. Yesterday, Mary gracefully, gracefully asked me to, to do one of those lectures at, the, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which I did. Um, my premise is that an educated populace is better able to reconcile its past, come to grips with its present, and be intentional about its future. And given that computing is the future for all of us, it, it's the fuel of civilization, I think it's important that we have that level of understanding. We, in working with the Computer History Museum, then latched together with KQED, the corporate, uh, the, the public television station in the Bay Area. They love what we did, so they actually spent their R&D dollars to fund us. Got a producer, we produced a trailer, a teaser, and we took all that to corporate PBS uh, about two years ago. Beth Hoppe, the number two there. And she said, Brady, this is precisely the series to which we aspire. It's very much modeled after Sagan's Cosmos, not 
Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos, more of the original one. I think Neil's was great, but a little overproduced. Anyway, Beth Hoppy said, Grady, this is exactly what we'd have aspired to, but your producer is the wrong one. So we've been on a journey to try to find the right producer. So here I am, a geek, trying to play in Hollywood. Believe me, this has been quite an experience. <laughs> so if you know of any good producers, <laughs> please let me know. Aaron Sorkin would be my dream, or my writer. Uh, we've had Errol Morris actually approach us saying, Grady, I'm interested. We actually turned Errol down because Errol was too dark for our liking. <laughs> Seriously, so it's nice to be in a place where we have a, a solid enough concept that we can turn people like him down. We'll find the right story. I'm patient. It took 15 years from Sagan to go from Vision to, to the, the PBS series itself, so I'm, I'm a patient man. The story will be told. In the meantime, we have a book contract with O'Reilly, a series contract. So that's what we're busy working on, dealing with the stories. So that keeps me busy. And pretty much, I live in Maui, by the way. Pretty much those three things keep me busy on Monday. So the rest of the week, I'm just at the beach. So. <laughs> what you're about to see is a, a presentation that I first gave in Florence. I next gave at the uh, Grace Hopper uh, Celebration of Women Conference last week all very different audiences, and you are yet again a third very different audience. What struck me about the last time I did this at the Grace Hall, here we had, there were 12,000 women, and they were all like a third of my age, so it was incredibly humbling to be there. But it was also wonderful because of the energy and the confidence and just the excitement of that community there. What struck me, though, was the lack of understanding of both the history and some of the general principles of software engineering. So I was delighted to speak to them in that regard. In the case of the ICSI group, some of the history was not known to many, but most of it was. But I think for that audience, the key thing was, I was trying to give them a perspective that you guys are busy, your heads are in here, but what you do makes a difference. For you, I want to challenge you to say, Here's what's in my head in terms of the things that I see challenging us in the software engineering space. For the These are the things that are going to keep you and the next generation and the generation after that busy. So that would be my call to action. For you. So here's how you can reach me. I'm very, very accessible. As I often say, remember that every time an angel, every time a new Twitter follower follows me, an angel gets its wings. So it's <laughs> real free to follow me there. So let's begin. Software is the invisible thread, and hardware is the loom on which we weave the fabric of computing, a fabric that we have wrapped ourselves up in and embraced the entire world. Developing software is a bit like raising a child. You make stuff up as you go. There are often discoveries. You'll have times of tear and times of joy. And the hardest thing is to learn to let go. True with raising children in software. Developing software is kind of like building a doghouse. Sometimes you just do it. You don't need plan. You fail. You start over again. If you really fail, you can always get a new dog. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, this is the style that resonates in the valley. I've worked with many startups in <laughs> dog houses. Building software is often like building a house. The risks are higher. You need, some, you need some, some blueprints, but you make some changes along the way. Developing software is like managing a city. You have many stakeholders. You may know the right thing to do, but trying to make that thing happen is often very painful because of economic, cultural, political, historical constraints. Developing software is like having a, making a film if you're really successful, you'll get together a bunch of really bright people, and you'll, you'll work in a frenzy for a while. If you're successful, then you'll get a sequel. If you're really successful, you'll have a franchise. Developing software is like making love. It's both an art and a science. And to paraphrase Richard Feynman, sometimes it produces concrete results, but that's not always why we do it. <laughs> so that's software. Imagine for a moment you are a cultural anthropologist, and you have been parachuted in, in this case, to Papua New Guinea. Your task would be to try to understand and make sense of the culture, 
So you'd do some field work, you'd live with them for a while, you'd try to understand their narratives, their mythologies, their stories, the rhythms of their life. This is what a cultural anthropologist would do. If I were to then take that same person and parachute you into the valley, and put you into offices, These, this is the offices of Tumblr, and I think they're in San Francisco, you do the same kind of field work. And you'd observe, well, look at the tools they use. A very curious thing. They're sitting in front of these things for a long time. They have curious little symbols throughout the, the building. It's notice, interesting to notice that everybody seems to have a different machine configuration. They're kind of all over the map here. Uh, if you'd witness them during the day, you'd observe that there would be curious times where they'd all stand up and talk with one another and then sit down and go do stuff. People would be in and out, and they'd be there at all, all hours. If you were a particularly wise anthropologist, you would make an observation of the things you didn't see. And so the question would be asked, where do they hide the women? <laughs> yeah, there are no women in this picture. Very true of so many of the startups I encounter. So the lesson I gave, and I especially resonated with the women I spoke to at the Grace Hopper event, uh, women, of course, have been always an important part of computing. And as you well know, the term computer generally meant one who computes, and it was often not a thing, but a person, and it was often a woman who would do so. We have here the uh, picture from the 1890s. This is the Harvard computers, as they call themselves. So this is the beginning of Agile. You can see they're in a war room. There's a stand-up they have every day. I have no idea what this guy on this side does here. I don't know, just making sure they stay out of trouble. Um, but these were the original computers. And what these folks were doing were analyzing a variety of astronomical data in that time. So way back in the 1890s, we began to see this kind of thing codified. At the point in time that we could start applying some automation, we began to see the starts of waterfall <laughs> development. <laughs> because what would happen is that teams like this would be organized in such a way that each one would be doing a particular operation, and you would take the results and pass them on down. And so there really was kind of a pipeline. This is exactly what Feynman managed during the uh, Manhattan Project. His, one of his responsibilities was to manage a large team of computers, women, who did a variety of calculations. Um, and again, I don't know what the people in the background are supposed to do, but I guess they're managers. There was an alternative model, of course, as we began to automate it further, um, adding punch card technology around this time frame. This is when Eckert and Mockley came out with their classic book on punch card methods, and it's a fascinating reading to understand how they began to decompose these kinds of problems. It's significant to realize that the presenting problems were entirely numeric. So largely, much of the computing that was happening was this pipeline of arithmetic and other kinds of operations going on. Of course, there were alternative models. We see this with uh, Vannevar Bush and what he was doing with the differential engine. But it, too, was a bit of a pipeline kind of operation going on, analog model versus the other. In the right hand of this picture, if you look closely, there is a very dapper-looking Grace Murray Hopper standing here uh, in front of the Mark I. I had the delightful opportunity to meet Admiral Hopper when I was at the Air Force Academy. Um, and I, in fact, I still have my nanosecond from her. You, do you all know the nanosecond story? Who does not know the nanosecond story? Well, let me, for the handful of you who don't, let me explain it. So go, go Google this on YouTube, because she actually did this with David Letterman. It's really hilarious to see. Anyway, as she was you know, trying to pitch what she was doing and explaining the speed of these devices, she had a difficult time explaining that to her upper management. So she would get some of her engineers to take some telephone wire and cut it in lengths of about 11 and a quarter inches. And she'd explain to people saying, you know, here's a nanosecond. I'm handing you a nanosecond because this physically represents the distance light would travel in one nanosecond. Of course, realize if you've got an iPhone these days, probably running a two gigahertz device multi-core. That means in that one nanosecond, it's running, well, depending upon how many cores you have, between four to eight operations within that time frame. Compare it to the time frame back here. 
And again, the problems were largely numeric in nature, but of course, we could speed some things up. Well, jump forward to what happened in World War II. The, there's a premise I have, which we're trying to, to say in the series, is there are two really big influences upon modern computing. One of these is commerce, of course, and the second is warfare. And I would claim that much of modern computing is born upon what happened in World War II in the Cold War. And thus, we name our, our episode there, Woven on the Loom of Sorrow. Uh, tragic war as hell, but there were some good things that certainly came out of it. This is the Colossus. I had, uh, have had the wonderful opportunity to meet Tony Sale. Tony has passed away. Tony was on our board of advisors for the project. Excuse me. <coughs> have some water here. <clears throat> Mary, if my voice starts, you'll just have to take over. <clears throat> it's so much drier here than it is Maui. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And of course, this is the Colossus. If you ever have a chance, go visit Bletchley Park. It is the coolest thing. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Imitation Game. Great movie. Wonderful actors. Great movie. Terrible history. Uh, because it sort of conflates everything into what Turing did. Of course, this was great stuff, but it wasn't Turing that built it. It was the engineer, Tommy Flowers. We engineers, you know, got a band together. And, and Tommy never gets quite the press that, that Turing does. A number of significant things about this. Um, of course, the, the Colossus was born from the work that, that Turing had done on the Tunney machine. And this was the device that broke the uh, not the Enigma code, but the Lorenz code, and its presence probably reduced the war by, by perhaps two years. I don't know if you know this story, but uh, Churchill, of course, asked for all of these devices to be destroyed at the end of the war, uh, and it was kept actually a, a secret until the 70s, so what was going on here. One of the reasons why the UK was you know, not viewed as, as that progressive in computing, because it was all a secret. Uh, we, we, being the US and the UK, collected all the Enigma machines at the end of the war and just happily gave them to all of our allies without telling them that we had broken the code. And so truly, for decades, we had been able to read diplomatic cables freely without our, our allies knowing it. Of course, we'd never do that again. We learned our lesson. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fluke, one-time event. The point is that you know we, we've, been, we've been playing those games for some time. <clears throat> any rate, it was the women that ran most of these machines, by the way. Uh, so they were the operators of these devices. Very, very cool stuff. One of my most prized possessions these days, it was at Bletchley Park a few years ago, and I saw this little bin of, of old vacuum tubes. And I said, well, what are these? Oh, these are the burned out tubes we found left over from World War II. Can I have one? <laughs> They said, sure, take a handful. And they sent me about 10 of them. And I kept one and gave the others to the Computer History Museum. It's, it's really cool. Now you talk about agile development, go take a look at the ENIAC. Uh, I've, I've read the interviews of some of the five women who are, who are still alive. Uh, there's a documentary being trying to be based on this. And to understand how they did their work is quite fascinating, because they really were the programmers. What they will tell you is that they were given problems to solve, and then basically these women would go into a room and try to figure out how to do it on these plug boards. So that's the kind of programming that took place back in that time frame. Then it really was kind of agile, if you think about it. Very iterative in its nature. So now let's begin to do sort of a parallel bit of the presentation here. We're going to continue on in the history, but I'm going to look at it from the perspective of what was happening in the architectures of things that we had to build. Back in this time frame, there really was no profession as a software developer because you just were a computer person. And there was very little distinction between the hardware and the software itself. You were basically doing things that commanded the machine to do what it wanted to do, still very much in the symbolic era. But jump forward to where John von Neumann was, standing in front of a Johnniac, and look at the problems that he was trying to solve early on. He recognized, brilliant, brilliant man, he recognized the potential of what could be, and so began developing programs 
for weather simulations, nuclear simulations, and artificial life. Problems that we are still struggling with today, but the roots of those began in that time frame. So we began to see a subtle shift in which there were people like him who began to understand the problem was not numeric, but it was more symbolic. That now we could start building abstractions in our machines and start crafting our own vision of things and start calculating against them. So those ideas were born truly around this time frame. But as you begin to see, the software problem began to loom. Another phenomenon that had happened is that people started writing these programs for these specific machines. It was realized that reuse was a problem. And so one way to attend to the problem of reuse was let's add a layer on top of it of common routines that everybody can use. So we saw the proto-operating systems beginning to emerge around this time frame in the late 40s and 50s an indication that there was value in having this kind of reuse. What I find curious, by the way, and, and I'll come to this at the end, that reuse and the problems of, of repetitive software, having the same things over and over again, has been a problem since the beginning. But really, it's not as much of a problem that I see anymore these days. And I'll explain to you why I see that to be the case. Around this time, too, you had the IBM 650, which was the business machine. And it was a curious hybrid of a punch card and vacuum tube and the like. And here's one of our old hard drives, which I don't know, that probably was about 10 meg or something like that in that box. So wow, how far have we gone? I have got, I think I have 128 gig on this phone here. It's just, if it were the same weight, it would be quite amazing. But again, the problems were still very much um, symbolic in nature. This was where we had the beginning of what some call the programming priesthood. Uh, and I certainly endured through this. You would, as a developer, take your little flowcharts and start writing them. I still have my flowchart template from IBM. Uh, you'd write out your cards on this little template. You'd hand them over to somebody to punch them. If you were lucky, you could punch them cells. And you'd take your deck of cards hopefully not spilling them, and hand them to an operator across something, and you genuflect, and then you go away. And they'd come back and say, oh, Grady, you have greatly sin tax erred, and go fix these. And you would have that separation of, of human and machine, which was a curious thing. But this is the time frame in which the economics were very different, because our machines were very, very expensive, and humans were very, very cheap. So we would optimize the use of the machine itself. We therefore began to see the growing software layer on top of it. So whereas we had first the operating systems, then you saw the, the software layer. This is around the time frame that IBM Share began and reasonably called because it was an opportunity for customers to share some of their algorithms and the like. And we'd see that pop up all over the place. From a physical perspective, this is when we would take those machines and start adding lots of interesting devices to them devices that various humans could use, but then also devices that were attached to the physical world. This was also around the time frame that realized machines being very expensive, and yet they're idle much of the time. What can we do to optimize their use? This is when Project Mac and the whole time sharing ideas came into play. So we began to see the more personal relationship to the machines emerge, moving away from this distinct relationship, the programming priesthood, to the machines becoming a bit more personal. And then came the SAGE. If you look at any B movie, you'll see a lot of these devices. There were people that bought up those consoles after the SAGE was, uh, was decommissioned, and they used them in all sorts of B software flicks, or science fiction flicks, because uh, they're really pretty cool. They've got all these great lights and such on them. SAGE, of course, as you're, most of you are aware, was one of the largest software projects, and well, perhaps the largest software project in its time, never really used in anger. And there's so much that came there that, that influenced where we are today. The consoles, you say, having emerged from the ideas of whirlwind, uh, the notion of the beginnings of the human machine interface. This is around the time that I think we as an industry began to understand just how fiercely hard software development was. This was, uh, this was hard, hard stuff. And it was, of course, around this time frame that 
the NATO conference on software engineering, 68, uh, came out and said, you know, this, we really should have a discipline here. What did we learn from Sage? Well, I think we began to learn uh, that uh, software development as a discipline unto itself was not only necessary, it was essential for us to be able to move forward. Of course, around this time, that's the military side. From the commercial side, we had uh, the IBM 360, um, which changed a lot of things. And notice again the economics. Why did the 360 come to be? Well, it was invented largely to help customers preserve their investment in software. Gave them a way to take the same software and run it on a variety of machines. So we began to see a subtle change from the creation of these special purpose of machines to more general purpose machines. And that, of course, changed the world. This is around the time, a little bit later, of Harlan Mill's work and others who were beginning to worry about methodology. What is the, the question on the table was, with the growth of software, with the need for larger and larger systems and teams of people building them, the question was, what is the best way to organize those folks? And thus were born some of the early methods you saw later, of course, uh, later in the world, DeMarco and Jordan and those kind of, kind of folks that came out of this, Michael Jackson and the crew. But it was really born from the problems during this time frame. So we began to see the software problem growing and growing and growing larger, the NATO conference came to be. There's, there's controversy here. Mary and I talked about this the other day. The very term software engineering, who first came up with it? Uh, I've tried to find the answer to this. I'm get, getting conflicting answers. If you speak to any of the people who were involved in the 68 NATO conference, they will say, we declared that title because we thought it was provocative, and that's the first use of it. There are others in the camp, and I'm one of those, who actually think it's Margaret Hamilton who coined the term. Margaret was the chief developer for the Apollo 11 uh, guidance computer software. And it appears that in some of her earlier writings prior to the NATO conference, she used the phrase software engineering. Um, I think that's, that may be true. I'm still trying, I'm trying to talk, get a meeting with her. She's still alive and trying to get some of the documents. N NASA claims that this is true, but I'm going to try to go to the source. It wouldn't surprise me because she at heart was an engineer, a very pragmatic engineer indeed. And she, uh, she was really building some amazing software for, for this device. By the way, if you want to, you can look at the source code. The source code for the Apollo 11 guidance computer is available at the Computer History Museum. If you have some free time on your hand and you enjoy looking at assembly language, well, there you go. <clears throat> I think she in particular and the folks involved with the NATO conference, were any, were any of you at the NATO conference? I'm just curious. I bet some of you know people who were at the NATO conference. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. I also back a lot of books and gave them to us. Oh, very cool, very cool. I, occasionally when I get discouraged on current problems, I'll go back and read the NATO report. It's very uplifting. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, because the problems they were dealing with, you know, we still, we still encounter today. This is, of course, the time frame where the term software crisis was first really out in the press. And I think it was right and reasonable for them to declare it was a crisis, because they recognized that from a section for which the nation depends, the, the long pole on the town of software. And I think a lot of good, good attention came out during that time frame. So between their work, between Margaret's work, we really began to see attention focused upon software as an important thing. So more and more software out in the world. Our devices became larger. Our devices that humans spoke to became more rich. The devices that were attached to the world became smaller. And of course, a lot of this fueled by what happened in the microprocessor and transistorized era. It led then to the rise of the mini computer. Now, what was cool about this, I remember many a night I would sit in the laboratory and I would have this bank of 64 mini computers at my disposal. I felt like a god. <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, because now all of a sudden I had this amazing compute power at my disposal and it was all mine. Charles Simone, the, uh, the gentleman who invented Bravo and then what became Microsoft Word and Microsoft Office, relays the story that he remembers the same kind of thing, sitting in a room and he had this 
huge mainframe, actually, in his case, whatever the Russian equivalent of these was, at his disposal. And that just changed his life entirely. It also changed the software world a bit, too, because now, all of a sudden, we had greater computational power. We had algorithmic languages that were reasonably good. Uh, this is, again, the rise of, of, of Jordan, DeMarco, Constantine's kinds of things at this time frame. And we also had devices that we could attach to the world in some fascinating ways. And so the first explosion of computing moving from symbolic, well, first we moved from numeric to symbolic, and now all of a sudden we started building what Gertner calls mirror worlds. We started building our own universes inside our machines themselves. So it was beyond the symbolic, but we were building abstractions of the world. And that created all sorts of interesting kinds of, kinds of, kinds of problems. This is the time of, of Dr. Hoare, the time of Dijkstra's work, uh, predicate calculus. There was an explosion, a wonderful explosion, in the ideas of provability, of pro programming concepts. There were lots of new ideas of programming languages around this time. And it was a very, very vibrant time for us, because with software as a problem, it was recognized that we had to attack this problem in a myriad of ways. So very, very exciting time to be there. The next thing that happened with reduction of, of our processors and such, we began to see the devices themselves started becoming intelligent. So it wasn't just these machines distant we would begin to program. The programming problem started shifting, and it shifted toward the devices themselves that worked in collaboration. And not just the devices that we humans dealt with, but also the physical devices connected the world. Then, of course, was born the, the, the PC revolution. Lots of history behind it. This is the iconic instance of it. Uh, IBM did well, but also screwed up in this space. Uh, we thought at the time that hardware was the path, so our focus was upon standardizing the bus, and we sort of gave away the software. And that was clearly a mistake. Uh, but it fueled the revolution in this space. By the way, speaking of giving away software, let me jump forward to a, a contemporary story. Photoshop. Photoshop started in the uh, industrial light and magic. The guys were making some, uh, some special effects for Star Wars, the very first Star Wars. The gentleman who became CEO of Digital Domain was their boss, and he saw this cool stuff. They were working on special effects for some of the fight scenes. And he saw it and said, this is really cool. So he took it to his boss, who happened to be George Lucas, and said, George, these guys have built some really cool software. We should license it. And apparently George Lucas says, ah, it's just software. Let them have it. So this is how the fortunes of Photoshop came to be. The guys who developed it in the industrial light and magic took it, and the rest is magic. And they're you know, gazillionaires who own small islands around the world, <clears throat> literally, <laughs> literally, too. Of course, the alternative model was, was the Macintosh, um, which gave us a different way of, of interacting with, with our world. But again, from a software perspective, what was happening is all of a sudden we had some incredibly powerful devices for which we could build these full programs to interact with humans. So the, the, sh the nature of what we were developing started shifting from these mainframes off to these devices in which we were building our own kinds of worlds. Speaking of source code, if you wish, you can look at the source code to Mac Paint. We also have a copy of that at the Computer History Museum. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to interview Bill Atkinson and uh, his colleagues, and Bill carried with him a diskette, which was a Lisa diskette. He said, Grady, would you like this? Sure. And what it contained was the source code to Mac, Mac Paint and McWrite. Uh, it took a while for Bill to actually decode it because he didn't have a Lisa anymore. So he had to hack it in some way with another Macintosh, and we decoded it and all that, and we have the source code. Uh, Don Knuth has looked at the source code, and, and Don expressed that this is one of the most beautiful pieces of software you've seen. My reaction to Don was, you haven't seen a lot of large pieces of software. I respect Don. <laughs> Believe me, I have all the ultimate respect for him. But, but he tend to look at smaller things than, than what I worry about in the world. Nonetheless, I agree with Don in this regard, that it really is a beautiful piece of software. It is well architected, well understood, it's literate, you can read it easily, and it's, it's a, if you want ever to have a reading course in software, this is one you want to have to your students. Because the interesting thing is, if you look at the abstractions in the original McWright, 
they're almost identical to the abstractions that are in Photoshop. So the lesson here is that the right abstractions tend to, in, tend to endure. Back to Photoshop to finish up that story, and I know I'm bouncing around historically here. Uh, I had a chance to sit down with the current architects of Photoshop. My wife has taught me a technique of how to evoke the architecture from people. It's a technique that she has learned as a child and family therapist. If you go into a family and they're dysfunctional, or even functional, what you do is you separate the child and give them a piece of paper and a crayon saying, draw me a picture of your family. And you'll learn a lot from it. So that's what I do when I go into architects. I throw the managers out of the room. I get the architects of the chief developers, and I say, draw me a picture of your architecture. And, and that's what these folks did for me for Facebook. And what's fascinating, first off, there are two architects. One worked on the Mac code base, the other on the PC code base. There's a lot of sharing of code, but it was fun to watch the dynamics because they were arguing with one another over the architecture. And they finally did come to agreement as to what the architecture was. And as I looked at it compared to the McWright one, you can see similarities abound. It's, it's really quite fascinating. The history of how the architecture for Photoshop has evolved is a fascinating story unto itself. So to go back to this time frame in the, the 80s, 90s, we saw our devices that were fairly complex, and they themselves had many devices within them. So of course, the next thing one would do is, let's network them. And this is roughly in the shape of the first ARPANET. I am delighted to observe that I had my first email address in 1979. And there was a time that there was a little book that we had that listed the email address of everybody in the world. <laughs> I wish I had kept a copy of it. <laughs> but, but it was pretty cool to have. <clears throat> uh, of course, the problem then moved from those simple networks to these networks to these networks. So again, we saw a shift in the software problem. It was less so building islands and starting to build things that were truly out in the world. And it took us a while to understand what it melt, meant to build these network kind of things. And believe me, the ripples of this are still going on to this very day. More than not, when I get parachuted in, it's going to some bank or some other financial institution where the problem is they've got this huge body of code and they're trying to you know, make it accessible on the web and in the, in the mobile world. Um, Another quick aside, um, you're all high bandwidth people. I've been having some fascinating discussions with Martin Fowler on this very topic. The idea of what does it take to take an application and turn it into services. There's one camp that says you begin your software and you start identifying the services first. And Martin and I are of the camp to say, no, in a way, you have to start with a monolithic thing and then find the services from there. That's actually what we've done with Watson, and I'll come back to that story in a bit. But the point of this is that in a networked world, all of a sudden the world does change greatly because now the software problem becomes complex in a variety of ways. One of those ways is just the sheer complexity of other devices out there. You certainly have heard David Deutsch's concept of what a distributed system is. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a device you don't even know exists can cause the failure of your program. That's a distributed system. What made it even more complex is some of these devices now began to become portable. Um, and that changed the world as well, because now all of a sudden we could build interesting applications here that had a reach far out into the world. So we began to see truly uh, a bifurcation of the software problem. There were those who built things on the edge of the web, and there are things, people who built things inside the web itself. A lot of what I see in the press these days, you go to the Valley, everybody's trying to build the next Facebook, Tinder, whatever on the outside, and there's just a whole lot of that stuff. And that requires one set of software skills, but then you try, try to start talking to these folks about you know, mundane things like you know, security and <laughs> you know, stuff like that. They say, what me worry? You know? This is not important to me, largely because we've hidden a lot of those things on the layers below. But that separation of skills and the separation of the, the methodologies that I see is happening all over the place. So again, with this kind of network, what's been happening, we've seen these devices becoming certainly more and more complex, but many of them becoming mobile, and some of them becoming quite intimate in the sense that they are attached to things in the world. 
and some of them becoming really, really connected to the world, and many of themselves are powerful. This is what's led us to the Internet of Things, that now all of a sudden we have a framework that makes it possible for us to build things we never could have conceived of before. What frightens me much about the Internet of Things, and I hope it keeps you awake at night because I'm depending upon you to solve the problem, is the issues of security in this space. I see so many people building the latest widget that's out in the world and not thinking one bit about the security implications for it. It is utterly frightening. And not just the security implications, but the privacy implications. So that's, I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys to fix. <laughs> All right. Now, there's something else that's curious happening here. Because in the last few years, we've seen the move from these kind of networks to pushing things to the cloud. You may have heard the story as to how Amazon got into this business. And it really all re, uh, it always, always became because of a, an architectural decision that Jeff Bezos made some years ago. In the earliest days of Amazon, Jeff said to his developers, everything shall be a service. And this is in the early days of some of the heavyweight web services. His developers pushed back and said, no, Jeff, you're crazy. This may be true, but Jeff, you're, we don't want to do this. There was pushback, but he eventually pushed them forward. And indeed, everything was, was turned into a service in one way or another. The first important discovery was that having done that, all of a sudden, they could begin to pull away some of those components, remove the proprietary Amazon bits, and form branded Amazon stores. So they could take those components, provide them to others, and you would get, as a user, you'd get the same Amazon experience, but it was really being run by somebody else. The next thing that happened is that there was a very wise gentleman that said, by the way, now that we've componentized this stuff, there is a way for us to monetize what we've done. Let's take our excess capacity and turn that into a cloud service. And that began some years ago. Uh, I've seen actually the proposal, the guy, the, the pitch the guy made to Jeff. It wasn't entirely based upon the economics of, of monetizing their extra services, but it was hinging upon the fact that they'd already built the services that allow them to have this kind of separation. And of course, their cloud was born, and we're all Paying, uh, playing catch up to it. So this is a good example of where trying to take something that already exists and providing the services upon it and delivering it up in novel ways has real economic benefit. Now, what's beginning to happen and has really emerged over the last several years are the creation of these platforms, what marketing people like to speak of as ecosystems. So again, we're seeing a subtle shift in the nature of the business of software itself. There is a, the the business concept of dominant design, which says that it's kind of a hill climbing problem, which says it may not be the right technical design, but for a variety of technical, economic, historical, political forces, we've seen people rally around this particular hill, and that's what's happening. So you've got a hill around Apple, you've got one around Twitter, you've got one around Facebook. Those are the most visible ones. You've got other hills that have been people have planted flags in for things like are the consortium that's trying to provide common electronics. There's an analog to that called, I think it's called Mars, which is doing that for things that float and go underwater. Um, there's value in this. So there's economic value and there's technical challenge. The economic value is you get, much like networking, you get the power of the group. And so all of a sudden, you make the market a little better because now we can rely upon these standards. In the case of Autosol, or it was BMW who did this. BMW had a disastrous first start when they were trying to put electronics in their car. Uh, it was one of the most badly engineered user interfaces I've ever seen. I had a colleague who bought one of the early cars that used their iTouch or something like that. I forget what they call it. And he said the problem was it was so buggy, there was one time he literally got locked inside his car. And he could not get out. So he had to make a phone call to the OnStar equivalent, and they unlocked it remotely so he could get out. It was, this is not good. <laughs> BMW was very smart, and they realized they can't go it alone, and there would be no value in, uh, in them coming up with their own proprietary standards. So it was, it was BMW that led the consortium of European companies. 
I think it was around this time that I had a chance to talk with the CTO of General Motors. He's no longer there. And he was around that same time proudly saying, we have outsourced all of our software development. And I, was, I came up to him after the talk because I didn't want to embarrass him in front of everybody else. And I basically said, you freaking idiot. <laughs> because you cannot outsource innovation. And innovation is going to happen through your software. And we've seen this. The, the American companies have been far behind the European and Japanese companies in this space because we didn't get software. Those guys, those guys did. Anyway, the growth of ecosystems. What we find in these ecosystems is, again, the, the dichotomy that happens. You have the people that are building the ecosystem that are feeding these kinds of interfaces. And then you have the people on the outside that are putting them together in interesting ways. This is where the Watson story comes back to play. The Watson Jeopardy challenge ended up being about a million and a half lines of code, most of it in Java, bits of it in C++, little bits of Python, and other stuff around the edges. Uh, it was kind of a monolithic thing, well designed. But now we needed to take this, throw it over the wall from research to, to uh, uh, our commercial folks, and we wanted to slice and dice it in different ways. The story is true. In the earliest days of Watson and the Jeopardy Challenge, we taught it the Urban Dictionary, among other things. Watson began to swear, so we had to pull the Urban Dictionary out of it. Um, and the last two years, the team has been on a journey to take that code base and make it an ecosystem. And a couple of weeks ago, we announced that the ecosystem consists of 28 RESTful APIs that one can mix and match things, and that's how you access Watson. Its original form, there was one API. You'd ask it a question, you'd get an answer. But now we've decomposed that into 28. And we have a few hundred companies that have already rallied around that kind of that, that place. And that's great. So what you saw happen with Watson is the next stage of what people are doing. We're seeing the growing componentization of such ecosystems. And it's hard because oftentimes organizations will do it in a naive form. They'll put the interfaces in the wrong place. They'll just have the wrong cohesion, the wrong coupling associated with them. And it takes a while. And if the ecosystem is successful, then you know people will live with it. You see the growing pains, like with Twitter and Facebook, where they publish an API, and then they didn't like it, so they bring it down and change it out, which pisses off hundreds of small companies who have relied upon it. But such is the nature of what's happening. These things will stabilize over time. They certainly will. This is also why I've seen the rise of functional languages. Because with the rise of RESTful interfaces and stateless kinds of things you do, you don't need heavy duty languages like we typically see. So you'll see the forums and lots of people talking about how functional languages are just so absolutely wickedly wonderful. It's largely because of, of those RESTful interfaces we see in the world. I had a chance to interview John Backus about a month before he passed away. It was a wonderful interview with him up in Oregon. And of course, I asked John about his work in, in functional programming. And he said, he said Grady, I, I kind of regret doing it. Because what I learned is that functional languages are really great at making hard things easy, but they're really bad at making easy things. And they make them very, very hard. And that's the problem with functional languages. So I think we have a niche here where it makes a whole lot of sense. And they'll continue to be in that space. And I think that does make sense. What's happening next is we are seeing some of these devices becoming extremely intimate. And so it's not just these devices connecting to other devices in the world, but also connecting to humans. And there's a tremendous amount of stuff happening here. Uh, the work that, uh, well, I, I, the work I see happening in, in literal brain machine interfaces, prosthetic devices like this, it's pretty powerful stuff. And although this is still a niche, I raise this because it says that the stakes of software development become very personal in this space. The next thing that's happening, and it's not just me doing IBM marketing speak here, but I see this in a variety of other companies, we're trying to make many of the edges of this cognitive. Um, I'll give you an example outside of IBM. General Electric, uh, and this is associated with the Internet of Things problem, General Electric has lots of jet engines and turbines and things like that. Tremendous amounts of data are produced from these things. So one architecture says, I've got a jet engine here, and it's recording all these things. I'm going to dump all that data across to the world. Well, 
that data has weight and there's cost transferring it and there's noise and all that. So what General Electric has been doing is putting more of the intelligence on the device itself. There are actually cognitive reasoning facilities on the jet engines, in the wind turbines, so they can begin to predict failures and things like that. You know, Grady, I predict a 100% failure of unit AE35 in 72 hours. And some of you laughingly remember that. It's the line from 2001, A Space Odyssey, but that's the direction we see happening. And it's really done because of the physics of data, that there's so much data being created at the edges that I simply can't manage it back in the center. And so we start pushing the cognition out to the edge. The end game for this is here. Here's the question for you. Which are the humans? Well, there are three of them. They're standing. But what you're looking is the geminoid line of humanoid robotics developed by a gentleman in, in Japan. There's a person here in, in Texas, David Hansen. You think these are realistic. He has even more hyper-realistic ones. I mean, we've, we've leapt over the uncanny valley with the stuff that, that David has done. He's patented some techniques for basically modeling human muscles in the, in the face. And it's, it's beyond creepy. It truly is. <clears throat> this is the space I'm working in these days um, as we start our cognition to true devices like this. So that brings us kind of the present. And I think, let me summarize what I've said here. We've seen a shift in the nature of computation from numeric to symbolic to building builder wor model worlds, mirror worlds. We've seen a shift in how we organize people to do it. We've seen a shift in the kinds of languages we do. We've seen a shift also in where the software itself lives. We used to build islands. Now we build things that they're hardly islands at all. They're, part of a vast sea of other applications out there. And that introduces security issues, privacy issues, all this. If you jump back to the time of Alan Newell, he said something, I think, very profound in the late 50s, early 60s. Computer technology offers the possibility of incorporating intelligent behavior in all the nooks and crannies of our world. With it, we could build an enchanted land. Well, if Alan were here today, I would observe to him we live in that enchanted land in this very moment. If I were to take the technology I have here and move myself back to the 1400s, I'd be burned at the stake <laughs> as a witch, because what I do looks like magic. We are in that enchanted world at this moment. So the question then is, what happens next? If I think back to the applications, if I were a programmer back in the 50s or 60s, I would think that I'm doing some really cool stuff, and this is great fun, and it's economically interesting and technically interesting. But I wouldn't necessarily think about the implications beyond that. We're in a stage now where I'm going to put a, put a line out here that I will defend, but I hope you take it to heart. Every line of code you write has a, a moral implication to it, that the code you write changes the world. Now, it may not change the world very much, but the aggregate of it certainly does. And so to that end, and this is the premise of our, our, our series, we've played a fundamental role in the advancement of the human spirit in every place you might imagine. Um, we've changed the way art works. We've changed faith. It has an impact upon it. We have an old episode on, on that topic. Uh, we've changed the way we work in the world. I'm not as, as glum as Sherry Turkle is. Uh, she's delightful woman, written some great books. Uh, her most recent one, Reinventing Conversation, is a much read. And I will admit, living in Maui, my wife has this fun little thing she does where we'll sit at the beach at sunset and she'll take pictures, mostly of tweens and, and teens walking on the beach in their bikinis or speedos with their iPhones. And there's you know whales jumping and birds singing and beautiful sunsets. And they're like, they're here. Where they put their iPhones with their bikinis, I don't want to know. But, but you see it all the time. Things are changing. Is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Uh, we know that their minds are changing, literally. Uh, things are changing from social perspectives. I don't know what the end game is, but we're changing people in that regard. And we're changing every nook and cranny in it. But I would assert that we've just begun. We are in a place where we have this incredibly rich primordial soup of stuff that we as an industry has built. 
And we are just beginning to look at the possibilities of where it could go. This is why this is such a vibrant field right now. Now, I'm not a venture capitalist. My opinion is that as I look at some of the funding in that space, they're doing some insane things. We have too many unicorns. If you follow that phrase, there's going to be an implosion. That's OK. That's how the marketplace works. But we're in a place where there is still tremendous opportunity. Uh, the phrase you may have heard is that software is the stuff that you yell at, and hardware is the stuff you kick. <laughs> That's how I explain the difference to, to my, my non tech people. But you and I are in the business of bringing these systems to life. We are the ones who are responsible for taking the possible and turning it into, into this kind of reality. Um, as I step back and look at different methodologies over time, I've come to the conclusion that what, what uh, a colleague of mine uh, wrote on a napkin some years ago, Brand Selleck, still applies. You look across the development life cycle, and there are always three overlapping phases. There's a period of discovery, a period of an invention, and a period of implementation. What waterfall methods tend to do are to separate those quite distinctly. What agile methods tend to do is to throw them together in one big life cycle. I think you well know that the right balance is somewhere in between. It depends upon the nature of the problem, historical reasons, your culture of your development team. It's not a one fits all. Get amused at these, these religious debates over methodology because it's, they're all sort of right in one way or another. Uh, but it depends upon the domain. One thing I do know that's consistent among every project, and I'll, this is the first question I'll ask when I get parachuted in, what's your rhythm of releases? Tell me about your release process, your release and test process. And if there's a regular heartbeat, then we can move on to the next levels. If there's not a regular heartbeat, then I know the patient is in crisis, they're bleeding on the floor with arrhythmia, that's the first thing I'll fix. And until that's fixed, it's hard to instill any other kind of discipline into what they're doing. Mary and I had a delightful discussion about the other day about is, is software engineering truly an engineering process? And Mary, I mentioned that I had a chart to that end. Here's, here's I say, I think engineering from this perspective is one of the resolution of forces. That when I build these kinds of things, I am basically tasked with looking at the forces upon me that are both static and dynamic and trying to build a reasonably optimal solution that weighs back on those forces. What are those forces? Well, there are, there are some of them that are capricious and arbitrary from the perspective of the business. Cost and schedule, they're often, frankly, quite arbitrary. And this is what infuriates me about some of the agilists, because they say, well, you know, schedules don't matter. Schedules do matter, because you have this nasty thing called money and time that gets in your way. And so yes, in a perfect world, I wouldn't worry about those things. But I do have to worry in a perfect world. So there's that set of things. Uh, we also have issues of just the nature of the problem itself. Uh, for example, the very issue of compatibility, that I may have to build something that's not greenfield. Facebook did not have a legacy problem at the beginning. Facebook has a very real legacy problem now. And you begin to see the weight of their software that's subtly changing the way they build things. They're growing up. You also see a set of forces around the teams you have themselves. Uh, in a perfect world, I would hire all A++ developers who also had no life other than development. This is the Silicon Valley model. This is not the world in which I live. On the average, every average developer is average. <laughs> and so, so I have to deal with that skill set. And furthermore, if I'm in a larger organization, I have to realize they're not just disposable creatures. They do have a life. They do have a desire for a career. And so it's more than just that. So that's part of the culture. There's also the illities of the system itself, functionality and all that. But increasingly so, which is weighing upon organizations, are the legal and ethical issues. And I'm not just talking patent stuff, but I'm talking about the implications beyond it. I predicted this about a decade ago, that I'd start seeing development teams with lawyers on the team. It exists now. More than once, I will see that to be the case. And it's uh, both a good thing and a bad thing, but it is, it's certainly a thing. So this is why I speak of software engineering as an engineering process, because these are the forces that every project of economic interest, every project that matters, seems to have to push back. And as, 
a software developer in the midst of it, these are the things that weigh upon me. There's another way to look at this too, and some of you may have heard this riff, but let me expand it upon it a bit. It may look like that what we have in software, anything is possible. And from the outside perspective, that's what the general public views. There's just no end to this magic. We can do anything. But you and I know that we can't. There are things that constrain us. And so what I have here is a notion that says, on this one end, I've got this wonderful vision for what I'd like to do. On the other end, this is the reality of what I create. What are those things that limit me from being able to do so? And I believe it's a spectrum. On the one hand, I've got the laws of physics, the speed of light. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. And I remember consulting on a DOD project in which they had this huge satellite thing around the world and yada yada, and they wanted to do things, some things that were basically you know, events that would happen simultaneously. And I said, basically, you can do that as long as you're not in this universe. <laughs> because to do so would violate the general law of relativity, and it's not going to happen. And they said, oh, simply a software problem. I said, well, I'm off. Well, actually, they kicked me off the project, which was fine. Uh, the, the project got canceled some years ago, so I, was, I felt vindicated. From a software from an industry perspective, let me also frame this in terms of the opportunities of what needs to be done. Yeah, we've got those nasty little laws here, but as Feynman said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. We see a way to put a single bit on the spin of a single electron of an atom. We think we know how to do that. That's pretty freaking cool, <laughs> because imagine the density of storage you might have there. So that's one way to push forward. This is why also quantum computing is a thing, because we're trying to look at alternative models. This is why neural networks are a thing. We have a project that's built a chip called True North. And well, consider for a moment, human brain about this size of some watts of power, unless you are in Congress and it's much less power. And somewhere around you know, 10 to the 15th uh, uh, neurons with it. We've actually built a chip uh, using some interesting techniques that has about that same density, not as many synaptic connections, and running at about 80 watts. So you've seen the rise of artificial neural networks. The cool stuff that's been happening at Google with DeepMind and such is a reflection of that. We're now able to build neural networks of, of tens of thousands of, of neurons. But so, so that's happening in this space. I've had the opportunity to program one of those. It is so freakishly different than doing a, non -von, doing a von Neumann machine. You've got to just rip your mind out and start over, but it's, it's pretty cool to do. The need here is we need people to come up with development environments for it. There are no even, not even standards for taking a neural network topology from one place and moving it to another. There's no common standards. A few ideas, but no common ones. Anyway, that's the physics side. Lots of cool things we can continue to do, which is why I'm so excited by this market. The next is the area of algorithms, the domain of pure computer science. Uh, there's an important algorithm behind cell phones. I think it's pronounced the Viterbi algorithm, which deals with noisy communication. Without it, we wouldn't have these kinds of things. And there are many circumstances I encounter where we may know how to do it, but we don't quite have a good algorithm for it. And unless we have that breakthrough, we've got to, we've got to deal with it. So in this case, again, this is why computer science is still so important. We need, we need breakthroughs in that space. The next level up is architecture, that I may have the right algorithm, but I don't know how to structure it. And this was, in fact, the breakthrough at Watson. We, we knew algorithms for a variety of natural language programming things, but we didn't know how to bring them together. So the story goes that David Ferrucci was, he's, he's on the West Co East Coast, was working on some NLP things. He had colleagues on the, East, uh, on the other coast. And they said, dude, we need to be able to work together. So they physically came together in a room and said, how could we build something that would allow us to share data among our algorithms? And the answer was, oh, let's build a pipeline. And thus, UEMA was born, the Unified Information Processing something or other. So this represents that you may have the right algorithms, but until you find the right structure into which you put, the, put them, you can't move forward. The next thing, hard thing is, is that of organization, that yeah, you can start off by putting really smart people into a room, but that's not sustainable or repeatable. 
Uh, it's a great way to do a startup and get you know several billion, but it's not the way to build an enduring business. And so this is why work still has to be done in this space. I think we we lack an understanding of the best way to organize our teams. I'm very enamored of Jim Copeland's work, um, as witnessed in the book Organizational Patterns for Agile Development, one of the better books I've seen that talk about those kinds of structures. This is where a lot of the debates and agile methods come to play, but it is a limiting factor to move us forward. Next level up is the problem of, of economics. This stuff costs. And uh, even though I may come up with a best idea, there is a true economic cost and an opportunity cost to building these things. That's a limitation. And then lastly, just the human things. There are things I know I could do I could build an autonomous killing weapon, should I? This is an area where one needs to have dialogue and discussion because we build systems that matter, that change the world. Software is not a thing we do in a room anymore, but it's a thing that reaches out into the world and impacts all of us. The way I like to distinguish this to folks is to say, if you look at what science has done for us over the millennium, we looked at the vastness of the cosmos we tried to reduce that to the simplest laws, the standard model. What we have done in computing is precisely the opposite. We have taken the simplest of things, the ideas of Turing completeness, Boolean logic, the ideas of switching systems. And from that, we have been able to create systems of exquisite and fierce complexity to which we are only limited by those things I described before. So let me spend a few minutes to wrap up here telling you where I think the interesting things going on are. And we'll sort of follow that, that framework I did earlier. This is a beautifully engineered Turing machine. A gentleman who is a machinist built this thing. And it's, it runs. It's very, very cool. Uh, he's going to donate it to the Computer History Museum uh, in a bit. So from the very bottom side, this is why I see developments happening in quantum computing. We're probably. I'm terrible at prediction, but certainly a generation away from building some pragmatic ones. The problem, of course, is that you need an advanced degree in physics probably to program one of these things. So us, our challenge is what languages would make sense for programming a quantum computer? Don't know. I've, I've ch chatted with Charles Bennett and others in this space, and they don't know either. So this is an interesting challenge. I mentioned the neural network thing as well, too. From the language perspective, um, there was this thing called Ada some years ago. You may have heard of it. And I think it's a good example. Ada was way ahead of its time. And it's funny to see the many features that are popping up in C++ and the like that Ada had way back then. So it was kind of ahead of its time. Uh, it was a great time uh, to be involved with that. And it certainly changed my life. So the question now is, we still see this explosion of languages. Uh, are any of them going to make it? Mm, probably not. That there is tremendous inertia in languages. So your children's children will probably still be debugging the Java code you wrote today. Uh, those are going to continue to be the dominant languages. Yeah, we see a lot of things happening in functional languages and in parallel languages and the like. That's OK. I think we need to continue that kind of innovation. But in terms of the dominant languages over the next several years, Honestly, I don't see any sea change in that space. We've had algorithmic languages. We've had uh, object-oriented languages. Object orientation was the thing for a while. And now it's entered the atmosphere, which is a good thing. It's part of the very background in which we build systems. And that's a good thing. So I'll, why I see development here, I don't necessarily see transformation in this space. Then there's organization. This is going to continue to be a struggle. I think over the next generation or so, the agile versus non-agile kinds of things. It's interesting because we're seeing backlash against the agile community that I think people are realizing, wait a minute, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid and there are some problems associated with it. So the pendulum keeps swinging from high ceremony to low ceremony methods. I think there'll always be movement in that from one place to another. But in terms of an alternative beyond agile and other things like that, I think there's general agreement that iterative and incremental methods are the way, but I don't see yet other methods popping out there. I keep my eye on who are the people that are kind of pioneering things like that. I don't see it. So if you happen to see such things, point me to those papers, but I don't see, 
I don't see anything other than that pendulum moving back and forth. What I do see, though, is that with more and more software having entered the world and having these dominant places, software development is increasingly like city planning. It really is. There's the great book Nick Bostrom wrote on superintelligence, and I just did an article for IEEE Software in response to it, and I said, basically, Nick, I'm not worried about the rise of a superintelligence. That's not an existential threat, and you can read the paper to see why. But rather, I said, the problem, Nick, is there's an opportunity cost. You're looking at the wrong thing. What frightens me the most is the fact that we have built our civilization upon software that is astonishingly fragile. Just as we under, uh, uh, under uh, represent the infrastructure of our country, we don't pay that much into sewers and, and things like that. Same thing's happening in our software system. So we have a lot of software systems like this that run the world, and it's not sexy, but you gotta keep these things alive. Software left to itself rots. It really does and changes. And so this is a challenge of the next generation. And the next place, which is both exciting and frightening, are the things you saw in the movie Her. It represents, again, this is a little biased because this is where my head is, but I see the rise of these cognitive systems. We have, we have our assistants here. We have Siri or Cortana. These things are becoming closer and ever present to us. They're becoming smarter as well. Um, Spike Jones was influenced by the chatterbot named Cleverbot. So he spent hours with it and just was taken by the notion, and that influenced what he designed in this space. But I see that happening as well, too. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening here. I did a survey of the robotics marketplace, and it's, it reminds me a lot of what the world was like just before the PC exploded. There's a lot of that kind of stuff happening. So I say on this one, stay tuned. What excites me also, and this really resonated with the young woman I spoke to last week, that no matter what future you envision, it depends upon software not written. So this is an astonishingly exciting time. It is, it is so fun to be in this world because we do change the world. But that being said, here's, here's the challenge I, I put to people, and this is a little bit poetic. Software is the invisible writing that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. Software is the invisible writing that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. What's so freakingly cool about being in this business is you and I are the storytellers. We have an opportunity to tell stories that change the world, and there are so few places that one has that kind of leverage. It is a privilege and a responsibility to be a storyteller. It's a privilege because we have a form that enables us to speak to millions, if not billions, but it's also, of course, a responsibility because we do change that world. So thank you very much. This was great fun, and don't forget to add some angels in the world <laughs> to join me. Do we have a little, thank you. Do we have some time for questions? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And if you have a spare 10 million in your budgets, I'd be more than happy to help turn that into a documentary. So <laughs> you have friends that do. Kickstarter. Kick, actually, we did do a Kickstarter project to, to help launch some of our lecture work. We did a Kickstarter project. We raised more than we expected. What was really cool is we had, uh, we had uh, people that contributed from every continent, including somebody that was in Antarctica. It is so cool. Got a dollar from them. <laughs> every bit helps. No questions. Oh, come on. My gosh. Well, I've, I, I've talked them into, I've, they're stunned. I, I like some questions. Or sleep, yes. So um, having done some historical looking myself, the communication side. Yeah, you know, yeah I saw your thing. Sage right. and, and the modem actually came out of there. Yeah. Right, and then you, another version, you mentioned the do line. Yeah. Um, so it seems that the communication aspect, and Licklider made this reference that mm -hmm. you know we'll, we'll have super community as long as you you know before it was built. Yes. And also uh, made this idea, I think that, that the world would be connected by a pneumatic tube system, yeah. <laughs> um, which is uh, perhaps the case if you think 3D printing is widespread with internet yeah. device files or whatever yeah. it is that will be propagated. So, yeah. So when that, assuming that happens, 
What, what's the consequence? <laughs> Big. <laughs> you know, it's curious because I, I have bought in this lifestyle that allows me to be remote in the world. I live on an island in the middle of the Pacific. Costco is an important part of my supply chain. <laughs> it truly is. And so is Amazon. Without Amazon, I couldn't survive on the island. Those two. We now have a target, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and I have no idea why it's Just don't use the credit card. Just don't use the credit card. That's right. So I think the end game is we're, we're really at the, still at the beginning of the implications of that transformation. I can see a day where I am almost fully self-contained. If I get a 3D printer that creates the things I need to do, wow, that would, be, that would make me even more independent. Now that's an upside and a downside. I think there's tremendous economic opportunity, but it also creates these smaller communities that become isolated from other humans. And there's a human cost in that regard. Um, I don't know. I'm not a futurologist. I, I think the future is cool and what the implications are. We'll wait and see what happens. Uh, we've got a long way to go, of course, in the right materials for 3D stuff. I can do a 3D printing of a cake, which would be pretty cool. But it's, and I see we're on path to build 3D printings of pills. Boy, the security aspects of that. I'm going to go print me some Oxycontin today. <laughs> I actually had bad reactions to Oxycontin. Tell you another story here. This is a software story related to this. Uh, I had elective open heart surgery. Uh, every my family died of an aneurysm. And after my nephew died at age 20, my wife took me in to get a CT scan, and sure enough, I had an aneurysm. I'll jump ahead and I'll come back to the software side of it. Jumping ahead after the surgery, they gave me oxycotton and I hallucinated on them. So I believe that every I believed I had a, a dozen supermodels that were living in my bathroom. <laughs> yeah. I had the most fascinating time to say to. They were all wearing scrub greens, by the way, which is pretty bizarre. <laughs> I don't know how, how Limbaugh, Limbaugh did that, but uh, Oxycontin wasn't good for me. Here's the software part of the story. I was laying there for my CT scan, lying in the CT machine, and I looked up and I said, hmm, Siemens, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Oh my God, I know the people that wrote this software. <laughs> <laughs> And furthermore, they used the UML, so I felt okay. <laughs> no, literally, I, I knew the guys that wrote the software. It was really humbling. <laughs> it truly was. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, Don. Um, what you just talked about, of uh, being able to survive on your own, uh, triggered something in my mind. Uh, I've often said that the world's best uh, case tool, if you will, or our mm -hmm. modeling tool is a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason that you get multiple people around it yeah. and they'll grab the, the marker from each other and there's all this kind of interaction that yeah. you don't get when someone's actually using the tool, even with something like pair modeling, if you yeah. will. Yeah. So, so what do you see uh, in the future to give that kind of immediacy uh, when you're actually separate. Well, I'll tell you how I work, but I'm, I'm unusual. You know, you've known that for years. But I have actually a beam robot that I use on the West Coast and another one on the East Coast, so I can have a robotic telepresence. So it's kind of like being there. I, I don't have as quite a handsome a body as the robot itself, uh, and I can't manipulate things in the world. But I see moving in that direction. Uh, what NASA has done with their Robonaut too is so cool. It has no real legs because you don't need legs in space. Think about it, they get in the way. You need to clamp onto things. But it has wonderfully articulated hands and the like. I can see a day where there could be injected into a robotic telepresence. That's certainly in the mind of some of the deep space missions. And so as I see that evolving, certainly the same thing could happen here as well too. And yet, it, it begins to raise some really deep and I think important ethical questions and philosophical questions. What does it mean to be human? Uh, is it okay that I project myself out in that way? Or do I need to have the warmth and the smell and the visceral things of a human next to me? I don't know. That's the domain of science fiction. Um, one more thing and I'll, I'll get to Mary. Rodney Brooks has, has talked about, you know, we're never going to see the singularity because by the time we get there, we ourselves will be machines. One of the things Nick, Nick Bostrom laments is 
these machines will take over humanity. And my response to that is, you say that as if it's a bad thing. Seriously, I don't know what the nature of evolution is, but I know that we're doing things that are going to be part of that evolution. Mary. Brady, you've, uh, you've addressed this discussion to us as uh, highly trained competing professionals. Yes. Uh, but we have a lot of data that says that of the software that is created in the world, probably 90% of it is created by people who are not highly trained computing professionals. Yes. What obligation to, do we as highly trained computing professionals have to put in the hands of that other 90% uh, the capability of developing things that satisfy not only their immediate needs today, yes. but their unspoken needs for um, subsequent uh, um, side effects of... Uh, yeah. Oh, Mary, that is a brilliant question. I think we have a responsibility in the following way. I celebrate what Code.org is doing, for example, trying to teach everybody the notion of programming. But I think we, as an industry, need to do two things. We need to teach the ideas of computational thinking. So programming is a vocation, in a way, but the way to think in the world in which we have a disciplined way, that's one thing. And the second is, I think we need to continue to build tools, interfaces, et cetera, that hide the complexity from the world. Because building distributed, concurrent, secure systems, we have a hard time doing. And therefore, we have to deliver things that others can use on the outside that minimize the cost of that. So I think it's both education and pragmatically delivering things. But there is a responsibility. We just can't be silent in this. Uh, well, that answer addresses just because we can. Yes. But there's another another half. Mm -hmm. which is just we can, just because we can, doesn't mean that we should. I'll go along with that. And and understanding the consequences of the thing that you have done is hard enough for us. Yes. And even harder yeah. for the ninety percent. Yeah. Well, one thing we could do is one of you could be elected president and start directing <laughs> policy. I think Donald might be in the need of a computing advisor. So, actually, yes. lots of advisors, <laughs> hairstylist advisor. So, <laughs> Mary, you ask a profound question that leaves me gobsmacked. That I think you ask a question that is right and proper and deep, and for which I don't have a full answer, but I will dedicate some neurons to think about that one, because it is, it is a, the right question to ask. Thank you. You're going to keep me awake at night. <laughs> but you guys are going to have the answers. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. That's, that's profound. In the back, time for maybe three more and maybe as many questions answers. Yes. So we talk about architecture, and it seems like some of the safety huh? documentation supplies that we do have some understanding of the organization that's intentional. Yes. So what about the interaction of somebody who makes an app? And that kind of changes society through some changing conditions. Yes. So what about emerging properties and how do we deal with those as you know architects and thought leaders and the like? A great question. I look at it from the technical level and the social level. That a lot of what's happening in those spaces, we do discover new kinds of architectures. Look at the the open server stuff that's come out of Facebook and the likes. It, we couldn't have engineered it, we would have screwed it up if we had engineered it. But by being, you know, fiercely uh, tended to in the fires of the real world, the open server thing came to be. That's very cool. So I think we're going to see more and more of those kinds of things. Same thing in the app space, except to realize that we already have a number of walled cities. There's the walled city around iOS, for one, and there's a walled city around Android. I don't see any other empires emerging other than those two right now. So architecturally, that's honestly an uninteresting space for me right now because most of the architectural decisions have been made in, in those cases. And until such time that I get widely even more computational power on these devices, I don't think that's going to happen. From the implication perspective, it goes back, I think, to Mary's question that I can't know the implications. What's the implication of Tinder? Well, I don't know, but there certainly are societal implications in that case. Some are saying it's as explosive as the pill was in the 60s. Uh, it certainly has changed the nature of interaction of some folks. I'm happy to report that I actually found the first couple 
that met via Tinder. Not the first couple that met via Tinder, but I met a couple that actually met via Tinder, and they're still together. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So the societal implications, I don't know. They're hard, and, and I think the best we can do is to be intentional about it. As an example, I have signed the Institute for Future Life's letter about banning autonomous killing weapons. I think that's right. Because the best we can do is we can't anticipate the changes. We're certainly not going to stop the changes. But societally, we can be a part of the dialogue of those changes. And that's, that's what I can do as a person. There's a question over here. Yes. Um, I wanted to challenge you a little bit on what you said about languages. Please do. Um, oh, I, I'm hoping you would. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because, first of all, there has not been a decade yet in computing in which new kinds of languages have not had a transformative effect in the field. I don't okay. think that's going to stop. Okay. And let me point you to two things that yes. I think uh, are, are important, both of yes. which relate to your talk. Uh -huh. One of which, is, one is, you spoke of the, of the Tower of Babel. We do have an ever-expanding number of languages that are being used. We, do. we need these, we need ways of integrating these, because yes. I think um, better coordination will actually, uh, will actually make them more powerful as they come together. The second is, we don't have good runnable, abstract, runnable abstractions in language for architecture. And I think that's a huge, that's a huge issue. I don't know what that means, runnable abstractions. What, what do you mean by that? Can you expand upon? I think one should be able to describe architecture mm -hmm. in a runnable way. Ah, OK. You and I ought to sit down over a very tall pint of Guinness someday <laughs> and have that conversation. Let me. I want to talk with you more. So first off, I really appreciate you challenging me because it gets boring when people don't. And it's a good example of a language in this decade that has made it big. Swift is a great example. That Swift came seemingly out of nowhere. And yet, if you look at Swift, Swift was an evolution of other things. It's not radically different than others. And the only reason, honestly, that it became big is because Apple was behind it and there was a large installed base. So until those circumstances are met, it's hard for a language from the grassroots to pop up because of those economic issues. Swift is an exception because Apple is an exception in that case. So uh, we got to talk about the, the last thing I'll mention is with regard to executability of things. So the UML is an example. I never intended to be an executable language. I think it was a mistake for it to move in the direction of executable UML. I'd always imagined it to be a language to reason about and understand a system. And so there were some who took it to the direction of executability. And that was interesting for certain domains, but the semantics of it, we never designed to be that precise. And that was a mistake. You're talking about the reverse, being able to look at an architecture and execute it to some degree. We're kind of in the same space then. So I think there's some value in the simulation of it down to the runtime execution of it, all of a sudden we've now built a language and we know where that path led on the UML. Email me, follow me, we'll have a delightful conversation. <laughs> one, one last question for us. I think you were the last one? Yes. So I'm wondering what you think of as coming in the conversations about like signing human rights to machines. Yes. I'm um, sure you have some interesting thoughts on that. Yes, I think legal precedence is already starting to be laid. If you look at what's happening with the Google autonomous car, we begin to see legal frameworks being created in California in particular. And in the non-computing space, there are already legal cases for the phrase non-human persons. And that have been applied to orangutans and chimpanzees and certain species of purposes. So there's actually some legal frameworks happening in that space. And they contribute to campaigns. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I think that's a discussion a future generation is going to have and should have. We I believe we're on a path to building devices that are very close to what we would consider consciousness. My personal opinion, which is a longer discussion unto itself, is I believe that the mind and consciousness itself is computable. And so it will force that question. And even if it's not fully computable, or consciousness not, is not fully so, we're going to get awfully close to the illusion of it, which begs that question. So that'll be a question that science fiction writers have dealt with now. Your children's children will probably be arbitrating in court someday. I hope we will treat them better than we have treated other folks we have viewed as lesser.
So, fascinating discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you.